Okay. Well, I guess this is it, guys. We're here. Everyone hear me okay? All right. Yes. Good. Good. Thank you. I want to say good evening to everyone on the panel and everyone who's watching, and thank you for joining us. Uh, welcome to tonight's clinical webcast, Expert Insights into Myopia Management. I'm your host, Alan Glazier, and I'm excited to be interviewing three world-renowned experts and friends as well. A special thank you to Oculus for organizing the webcast. And for some technical details, just before we get started, there's a text box on your GoToWebinar screen where you can enter questions. Enter questions at any time, and we'll discuss some of them during the talk, and some of them we'll wait towards the end, and some we won't discuss at all. But uh, a few things I just want to tell you are certain to happen tonight, such as my dog will bark, and someone out there will have technical difficulties, yet life will go on. So we'll power through any and every interruption. Uh, I'd like to start by uh, introducing the expert panel. The first member of the panel I want to introduce is Dr. Langy Michaud. Uh, Dr. Michaud graduated from l'Ecole d'Optometrie de l'Université de Montréal. He's been a professor since 2001. In 2020, he became dean of the School of Optometry. Now, he's a diplomat, a diplomat of the American Academy of Optometry, a fellow of the British Contact Lens Association, a fellow of the Scleral Lens Education Society, and the European Academy of Optometry. He's authored many articles in peer-reviewed journals about specialty contact lenses and myopia control, and he'd been invited to speak around the world on these topics. He's an editorial board member of the Journal of Contact Lens Research and Science as well. Next, we have Dr. Carrie Herzberg, who's been practicing orthokeratology and myopia management for over 35 years, just about when I was born. He lectures extensively on the topic and holds a patent on the first scleral orthokeratology design. He's lectured and written numerous articles covering the topics of specialty contact lenses, myopia control, and ortho-K. He's co-founder, president, board member, and fellow of the International Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control. And he's the founder, former chairman of the board of the American Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control formerly the Orthokeratology Academy of America, OAA. He has visiting professor status at Hei Ai Hospital, He Ai Hospital, University in Shenyang, China. And last but definitely not least, uh, Professor Mark Bullimore is an internationally renowned scientist, speaker, and educator based in Boulder, Colorado. He received his optometry degree and PhD in vision science from Aston University in Birmingham, England, he spent most of his career at The Ohio State University and University of California, Berkeley, and is now an adjunct professor at the University of Houston. He's a consultant for a number of ophthalmic, surgical, and pharmaceutical companies with products and services in the areas of myopia, contact lens, low vision, presbyopia, and refractive surgery. Just about every area of the eye there, Mark. This work has resulted in approval of, among others, Paragon CRT, Alcon's Ilux, and Cooper Vision's MySight lens, impressive. Now, the way I'm gonna run this tonight is I have assigned four or five questions to each moderator, starting with what I call a speed question. It'll require a short one or two sentence answer that will run by each of you first, and we're gonna end also on a speed question. So in, in your most succinct uh, way of explaining it, the first question we're gonna ask is if you could, and I'll call you out, if you could discuss the importance of having the ability to measure axial length as part of a myopia management specialty, starting with Langy. Oh, this is the only way you have to know uh, what is, where the myopia is going and where this kid is going, because it's the only measurement, the objective measurement that we have in order to uh, evaluate the, pro the real progression. Thank you. Now on to Mark. Mark, can you hear me? You're muted, Mark, I think. Uh, well, let's go on to Carrie. We'll go back to Mark. Okay. The, uh, one, of the single, <laughs> one of the single most important things I've done in my practice of myopia control, myopia management, is to acquire the uh, a measurement of axial length in my practice. And this has changed the way I actually do practice uh, orthokeratology, myopia control, and, and how I re respond to, to a myope itself. So I think it's something that's really becoming uh, required in every practice that's serious about this. Great. And Mark, can you hear us yet? 
Yeah, that's a uh, Zoom call fail right off the bat. Um, <laughs> that's what I started out with, right? They said that was going to yeah, happen. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a drinking game, right? Somebody's <laughs> on mute, they get a drink. Um, so obviously, uh, Longy and Kerry, they're very into Earth OK, and I would agree with what they say, but I would say for soft lens control and for spectacle lens myopic control, axial, axial length measurements, not as critical. Um, I do think it's going to become the standard of care moving forward, um, but it certainly opens your eyes to what's really going on with the eyes, regardless of what modality you're using. All right, great. Thank you, guys. That's great. Great intro to uh, the axial length angle. We're going to start out now with the general questions. I'm going to throw the first one at Langy. Um and I, I, I wanted to bring up something about uh, that Kate Gifford said at one point. Kate Gifford is one of the world's foremost experts on myopia control, and her and her husband uh, are re researchers and professors in Australia. And she astutely pointed out that there's no, as she said, no growth chart for axial length. I thought that it would be interesting to ask if there was a growth chart, what, what might it look like? Wanji, can you comment on that? Yes, uh, my pleasure, and I uh, really respect uh, the, the work of Kate and her husband, Paul. You know, they are true leaders in my API management and they open the eyes of many practitioners around the world. So, you know, uh, thumbs up for them. Um, if, I, if it's possible to share my screen, um, I will just, uh, yep. And... I'll just put this here. So uh, can you see the, the charts? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this paper was published in 2018 from um, Tideman in the Netherlands, and it, it's really one of the first growth chart that was ever published in the field. So that shows up, you know, the actual length versus the age and the natural evolution based on the level of myopia and the potential to develop high myopia as well. So for the first time, we have something at least to evaluate the progression, just like the pedi pediatrician uh, will evaluate the normal growth or, or, and the weight of, of a kid in, in his office. So you evaluate age by age and visit after visit, and you can really customize the treatment based on that, based on the risk that you will project in the future. It's not perfect, obviously, every individual, you know, will progress differently, but in average, if you do nothing, this is what will happen in the future. And the goal here is, also to evaluate the successful of uh, the success of your myopia control strategy so let's say that you are in the middle of the curve here in the middle curve and and you are very very successful so perhaps you will go down by one step to the lower curve there uh, in, as the uh, years gone by and it's certainly one element that proved to everybody in the room, the parents, the kid, and yourself, that your strategy is successful and that you limit the progression of this myopia and certainly the potential to develop uh, high myopia. So this was for Caucasian and Diaz in uh, 2019 developed the same graph, but for Asian population, we know that it's completely different, you know, day and night from uh, Asian population and, and Caucasian population or European population. So here we have the, um, the graph of male and female Asian patient, again, showing the, um, the natural evolution of the actual uh, uh, length uh, if we do nothing. And again, we, you can evaluate where you are at and uh, what risk you, you are facing in the future. So you can really customize your treatment because if you're uh, remaining on the lower curve, but then the potential is, is lower to develop pathology over time. So your strategy will be, you know, regular. But if you are on the higher curves, then you have a very, very high potential to develop pathology. So you have to be more aggressive in your strategy. So then you, you will combine treatment or toki or atropine or something like that in order to be more effective in your control. And over time, you can evaluate what you're doing. These are the curves I'm working on a daily basis, on a daily basis at your university, and it's very, very helpful to, under, to make our uh, students understand what, we're, what we are doing, in fact. That's fantastic. That that really answered that question. I imagine there's going to be some uh, advanced mathematics that'll probably be able to determine the function for each chart and merge it into maybe some kind of an equation someday. Let's hope. Yeah, great. Sure. All right. Yeah, I'm just, gonna move. 
over to uh, Mark. Do you want to make a comment on that? Yeah. Um, Catherine Richdale will be presenting a, a slightly different approach at the Academy meeting where we've uh, used the, the Brennan axial length growth curves um, and tried to apply those in practice. So I think we're going to have a lot of opportunities here to apply new tools. And it's really about explaining what's expected, what can be anticipated, what could be hoped for to a, to a parent. Yes, excellent, thank you. Talking to parents is, uh, I, I give a talk on the business of myopia control and 70% of the talk is about talking to parents. So that'll be really helpful. That's the hardest part. The rest is uh, not rocket science from a clinical perspective. If you can prescribe contact lenses and, and eye drops and certain eyeglasses, you can practice myopia control. The people who figured it out, uh, like the people in this, in this lecture and others, um, they're the rocket scientists, but clinical application, nobody is more qualified than an optometrist to practice myopia control. So Mark, I'm gonna roll into you with uh, our next question. You know, we know certain methods work to control myopia, and, and now in the past 15 or more years, we, we have peer reviewed data to back up those claims. We've also learned that methods historically thought to provide benefits for myopia control have not been proven to have an impact such as under correction, st fitting standard gas permeable lenses and vision training and things like that. I'd just like to get your general take on that because um, I'm sure this is something you deal with quite a bit. <clears throat> yeah, so let's just focus on what doesn't work. Um, so under correcting doesn't work and in fact will probably, based on the evidence, um, accelerate progression. So it's the worst thing you can do on, for two reasons. It'll make things worse and the kid won't be able to see as well as they could if you undercorrect. Uh, conventional RGPs do not slow axial elongation. We have two randomized clinical trials that demonstrate that. Um, vision therapy, I don't really want to go there, um, but really there's no evidence base to support that it does any good as far as um, uh, myopia is concerned. However, Spending more time outdoors will certainly reduce the likelihood of a child developing myopia and may slow progression somewhat. So if you want to count that as uh, behavioral, and there's a bunch of other things that really don't do much good. So PALs have been shown in multiple clinical trials to have a very modest effect. Statistically significant slowing, clinically irrelevant. And finally, um, low doses of atropine, 0.01%. Um, a lot of the community, particularly ophthalmology, have embraced 0.01% atropine, but the evidence really isn't there that it's as good a um, treatment that we can provide. So I think we could do a lot better either with other modalities or with higher concentrations. So hopefully that answers your questions in terms of what doesn't work. That does, thank you. We've got a uh, hello from Joseph from Colorado. That's that's for Mark. Mark's in Colorado too. Um, and we've got a couple, two good questions here. Um, a Charles Griffin asks, what are your preferred instruments for measuring axial length? And Charles, I just want to tell you, we're going to be covering that. So I'm going to not ask that directly right now, but stay online and you'll get that answer. And uh, Safal Kanal asks, how do you manage myopic non-responders, which is, is something that we're also going to get to as well. I might re-ask that later. But for right now, we're going to move over to Dr. Herzberg, um, who is going to cover more of the business side for us for a second. And Carrie, I'd like to ask you that for colleagues who take vision insurance plans, they, they very likely bill out a myopia management exam as a routine yearly visit with contact lens services to a vision care provider without any plan on how to follow up going forward from a practice management perspective. Can you tell us about your program and how it differs and provide some basic advice on how to move towards a model similar to what you do and turn myopia into a real profit center for your practice? Sure, and I think that's a really great point to cover here because uh, you know, you really can't, I mean, it's nice to be dedicated and nice to be enthusiastic about doing myopia control, but if you can't make a decent living out of it, if it's going to be at reimbursement levels that you receive from VCPs, you're going to be in trouble. You're going to burn out. So you have to find a way to, to generate more income for that so that you can spend the time and, and get the resources you need to do it properly. And to do this, we really, 
being an orthokeratologist traditionally and starting out with that, we really kind of pushed, we're in that vein to begin with because we do yearly programs. We do uh, long-term planning with that. And so I think, you know, you have to begin thinking about this myopia thing and, and, and start with that, that yearly fee idea, the global fee. And that certainly doesn't work with uh, the VCP plans. They're not structured that way. Plus, this is really medical. This really isn't, uh, you know, we're doing, we're using some optical aids for it, but we're, you know, having a medical impact on the eye. So you have to really consider that. So structuring and, and looking at it and, and taking your, your program together and, and, this, and making it more of a global program, just deciding what your fees are going to be like, how many times you're going to need to see the patient per year. And then doing that, building that out to the patient appropriately, I think, you know, directly without a VCP entering into the equation is, is probably the way to go for most doctors. I think if they're really going to want to be successful in this. Excellent. Excellent. It's important to uh, let the parents know that from the get-go. Again, part of the, the 70 percent of myopia management is talking to parents. They want to make them understand that the value is different than just standard contact lenses. So if they go through right. the same process that you do with them each year with standard contact lenses, they're not gonna see the value that you're billing for and that's gonna harm you as well. You know, if I might interject something more into it, I think the reward part of this thing, and, and I've really been doing this so long now, I had the reward part of this. I have patients that have done ortho K for 35 years, believe it or not. And you, you look back at those things and, and the parent, you still see the parents along the way, the kids are now in college, you know, but they bring their parents in because you just wanna say hello. And you become a part of that lifestyle, you know, with the kids, you, it's almost like they're your kids. And to sit there with a the parent and then you look at those axial lengths and say, you know what, you know, the, this is an Asian patient, for instance, and the axial length is, is, is reasonable, you know, in the 24 or low 25 range. And you look at the parent and saying, good job, dad or mom. You guys did the preventive work early on. It, it makes a difference. And everybody should feel good about that. It's really a win-win feel-good story. Yeah. Absolutely. As myopia control is for the whole practice and any specialty helps our practices. And this is a particularly optometric one. Alanji, I'm going to roll back to you. Can you tell us the variability factors that we have to watch out for when we're making assumptions from our axial length measurements? For instance, the same patient probably won't have precisely the same head position year to year or quarter to quarter when you compare. The device is not calibrated always perfectly. Uh, using an ultrasound compared to a fixed machine like a B-scan. Tell us your, your insights on that, please. Let's see, it's, it's very important to, uh, to rely on the same instrumentation uh, year after year to to compare the comparable, meaning that you know if you if you have different devices to uh, evaluate the actual end and you vary from one to other, you know it, it's not really comparable because you know technology is different, and 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 so rely on the same machine with the same kid every year. So in, in my in my experience, uh, I'm using you know um, uh, biometers, uh, electronic and infrared biometers, and uh, and they are they are really really good. And regardless of where the kid is really looking or you know position his head, you know I, I don't have a lot of variability. Uh, we have more variability with you know ultrasound machines and then uh, immersion you know uh, technology that that is based on immersion um, because we we can have a different approach at that time. But, you know, with a regular biometer that we use on a day-to-day -day basis, there's not a lot of, of, of variation. And we um, we did also a study on um, pre or 2 k and post or 2 k uh, for the actual length, you know, you know, you know, baseline measurement, and then you fit the or 2 k patient, and one week after, you see the patient back and you reevaluate the actual lens. Obviously, the actual lens didn't didn't grow within a week, right? And and uh, we found you know 99.5 percent you know correspondence. That means that you know despite the fact that the cornea is now molded with the ortho K lens, you know it it's not really impacting the actual lens measurement. And it's all about you know also the resolution of your of your machine because you know uh, if you have a habitually we see um, natural evolution of 0.1 to 0.2 millimeter per year but if your machine you know uh, has a resolution of 0.05 uh, it may be probably too much so because you know it, it's a high variability just because of the machine itself so uh, make sure that you have the right tool in hand and the, the reliable tool uh, invest a few bucks and uh, yeah, you know i really agree with with carry because you know it, it, you can make this this practice profitable and and you have to make profit in order to invest in that modern technology that provide you with with the inst essential instrumentation you need to base your decision and your clinical decision 
That's a perfect segue, Misho, into Mark's next question. Is there a gold standard of devices for axial length measurement? And if so, which device, what makes it the gold standard? And if you could talk about devices a little bit, Mark. Well, as uh, Longy implied, the gold standard, both within myopia control and also cataract surgery, because these devices really were brought to the market for cataract surgeons, is the optical barometer, optical biometer. So those are optical instruments based on partial coherence interferometry, OCT technology. So the first one that was introduced about 20 years ago was the Zeiss IOL Master. And that still tends to be the one which, against which others are measured. And we did a, an early study on the device and demonstrated, as have other people, that it is much more repeatable than handheld ultrasound. So ultrasound can be your last resort if, because of cost issues, you can use an ultrasound instrument to measure axial length, but the variability between visits is gonna be much greater, and of course, you're gonna to have to numb the cornea and touch the kid's eye. Now, since the original IOR Master, there's been a whole host of excellent instruments. So one of them is made by Oculus, the Pentacam, but again, that's really a Cadillac instrument designed for the cataract surgeon. So now Oculus and some other people are saying, okay, let's put something out there for the myopia market. So the myopia master's coming down the pike um, fairly soon, and that will give just as good measurements um, as any other. So basically a lot of the optical biometers, IOL master, um, the, um, the pentacam, the what's the what's the uh, hard strike one called the uh, lens star the, uh, the lens star yeah I'm using yeah. the lens star this call yeah yeah so they all have very similar technology they all have very high very good repeatability um, that should be what you strive to use if you haven't got one it's not within your budget to buy one your local cataract surgeon has one there's a co-management opportunity there there's a chance for networking maybe his technician will every six months take an axial length measurement on a kid, kind of a drive-by thing. So network, maybe there's an opportunity there, or maybe the time has come in your practice to actually invest in myopia management and get one of these new devices like the Myopia Master. I wanna follow that up with another quick question for you, Mark. You said the one that all the devices are measured by, was that pun intentional? <laughs> uh, sorry, I couldn't resist. Um, but we do have a question backing up to the one that you addressed on um, on my op on uh, vision therapy. Of course, somebody wants to talk about that. They said that you said that vision therapy doesn't help with myopia control. And and just for the record, I want you to all know Mark did not say that, <laughs> but he didn't want to address it here. Uh, the question really is: Does it include accommodative lag? and children who have high exos. And um, I'll touch on that real briefly here, and then you guys, can anyone can chime in on that. So far, from my understanding, is that there is no peer-reviewed data that shows that accommodation has anything to do with myopic creep. And to, a, you know, question maybe 10% or so, I think I'll, I'll let you, the experts, chime in on that. And then yeah. with exos especially, it's the esos that we can do some management with spectacles and, and things like that. But please touch on that for one yeah. of our I mean, peers. I think it, it is important to manage the whole patient. So if they have ESO problems, if they have other binocular problems, if they have accommodative problems, perhaps you need to address that before you initiate myopia management. Now, in the original Comet study, which evaluated the effectiveness of PALs, they found in a post hoc analysis that there seemed to be a greater benefit in kids with esophoria and greater accommodative lag. Yeah. And for many people, they've latched onto that and not really looked at it any further. But the investigators did the right thing. They said, okay, that was a post hoc analysis. That was kind of a fishing expedition. Let's test the hypothesis. So they did a second clinical trial, Comet 2, where they compared PALs, and again, against the control lens, a single vision lens. But this time, they only recruited kids with ESO and greater than uh, 050 accommodative lag. What did they find? pretty much the same as the original <laughs> overall result, only a quarter diopter slow in over three years of treatment, which is kind of spitting in the wind. So be the optometrist, be the doctor, 
but don't feel that accommodative lag is necessarily where it's all at. And it, it's all it's all depending on the way you evaluate the accommodative accommodative lag. You know, the way you evaluate it will will provide you different results. And what we know to the contrary is that you need natural accommodation to be effective within your myopia control strategy. So you, you, you need that. So that doesn't mean that if you have a lag, it will promote myopia, but your myopia control strategy will be less effective if you, have, if you don't have a natural accommodation. And some studies, peer-reviewed studies, prove that in soft lenses in particular, um, part of the uh, ad power may be used by the binocular vision system in order to fix the problems and not influencing you know myopia evolution so this is why really i call binocular vision as the first pillar of the myopia control strategy so you have to before implementing any strategy at all make sure that your binocular vision status is normal or near normal. And it may also dictate the fact that you will provide glasses instead of contact lenses or auto-K if, you know, for example, you have an exo at near uh, that is not responding to vision therapy because this exo will become more exo when you put a contact lens on, in front of th those eyes. So you, you may even face diplopia at that time. So that kid needs, you know, uh, glasses instead of contact lenses. and with your contact lenses, reevaluate the binocular vision status as well, because sometimes in some kids, you have to provide soft lenses, multifocal, plus a bifocal pair of glasses to read at near, because they need it, you know, based on their binocular vision status. So it's a little bit more complicated than that, but, you know, make sure that at least accommodation is functioning normally before implementing any strategy. Great. Thank you. Another great segue into a question for Dr. Herzberg. Uh, lately, um, there's been a lot of talk about ophthalmic lens technologies that claimed impact myopia control. Where, where are we with these? What are the early studies showing? And you can talk a little bit about how they work, Kerry. Yeah, the, it, it's interesting, Alan, because it's, I mean, we have more tools today than, I mean, we started out with ortho -K, right? And that was pretty much it, but now, and, and atropine among the ophthalmologists were using at the time, but I think today you have a lot more to use in, in the toolbox, and, you know, multifocal soft contact lenses in particular are a very interesting uh, development here that I think all of us are getting more and more into that, and there are a number of studies, the Blink study for one that just came out that showed the efficacy of that, you know, with close to 50, 60% control of myopia, even axial elongation was was really good, which in the early studies wasn't the case. I mean, they didn't, weren't measuring the axial length, so it was just refractive change. So I think things like the MySight lens, which is now uh, FDA approved, and that's a, I can't tell you how impactful that is for our field because growing up in this my, myopia control environment and not being able to talk about myopia control because basically the FDA didn't recognize it as being something that we could actually do. Uh, to have them re recognize that with the MySight lens is a huge step for everyone. Now, I mean, it just it's our own government that's saying now that that myopia control is for real and you can't you can control this thing. So it's huge, and the and the v, you know VTI is a, has a lens product that's available too, and they're talking about basically the it's the it starts with that the theory of the dual focus lenses that the that there's this myopic shell that you need in the peripheral retina. You need to see clearly through the macula, and then you need the the plus in the periphery to create that myopic shell instead of a what typically happens with spherical myopic lenses, which is de, hyperopic defocus in the periphery. And so this this theory, which is you know yet it is a theory, uh, is is based these a lot of these uh, principles are uh, and designs and what they are available here are, are based on that. So the we know it's being a theory. We can't say absolutely this is the way it is and what's causing it, but we can certainly you know the the the. the uh, practices of using these types of lenses that are creating that myopic defocus in the periphery, like the soft multifocal contact lenses like Ortho-K, are actually you know, impacting on that and controlling myopia. We can measure it. So we know we know it works. Uh, interesting enough, Alan, what's coming is this DIMS lens from Hoya that uh, is a spectacle alternative and has a 60% control of myopia. And that's really something because if you don't have to put a contact lens on, I mean, you could reach a lot more of the, uh, the people that need myopia control because that is a barrier for some. And so uh, this is exciting. 
you know, the, yeah. the, uh, that, that whole thing, yeah. Now that 60%, the study that determined that, was that an independent study or is that one done by Hoya? Done, done by Hoya by, uh, in a very limited number of patients, though. Uh, but, you know, the lens is probably effective, I would say, because we just had it in Canada and uh, began to prescribe it a few months ago, so we'll see in the future. Uh, but on paper, you know, it works perfectly. Um, I don't know any adult who would see well through that kind of lens, but kids are <laughs> resilient. And, um, you know, for those who are not familiar with the DIMS, you know, design, it's it's nine millimeter center uh, zone, for, so for distance, clear zone, surrounded by little islands of plus two, plus three and a half, you know, add power, you know, oh. distributed in a circle pattern all along the um, the rest of, of the lens. So it, it creates kind of peripheral defocus and you you have, you know, regular glasses in between those teeny islands. So on, on principle, it works, but, you know, we'll see in the future, but at least it's, you know, on paper, it, it, it's a it's the best thing that we have. You have SLR myopiolux in Canada that we have as well that is working well. Um, myovision from Zeiss is not that effective, my experience. Though on paper again, uh, works well. It may be different in your practice, but uh, we have tools. You know, the, the beauty is that now we have tools to yeah. select and, and to play with. Excellent. That's another another great transition. You're going to get sick of me saying that. Were you guys practicing one time without involving me? Because this is a little too weird. Um, so we're going to go to Lanji again to tell us about, we, you know, Carrie touched on the Blink study. And uh, there are some newer findings on the ad powers for uh, the lenses. The, I believe it's the ProClear, the Biofinity lens that has the distant center one, and the Blink study came out and answered an age-old question in myopia control, which ad power should you choose? I think we've all had our gut feelings on what that is, but can you tell us what, what they found and what you know about that? Yeah, uh, for a long time in the animal model, um, it was proven that, you know, you needed at least plus 3, plus 3.5, you know, ad power in order to influence positively the, the, um, the, uh, peripheral refraction and to create enough stimulus um, and, and Earl Smith even proved that it's not only the power but the area that is impacted that is really important. So it's, it's, it's not just the level of the, of the signal but the area of the retina that is impacted by, by the signal that drives, you know, the, um, the, uh, the effect of, of, of this uh, myopia control. So this study really uh, had uh, several aims. If I can share my screen again, uh, if you allow me to do that. Let me think about it. Yeah, uh, so <laughs> do you see my, my, my uh, screen now? Yes. So, so the aim was to compare soft multifocal lenses with glasses, and the hypothesis was there's a dose-dependent response in multifocal lenses. It was proven in the animal model, but never in humans, to determine whether peripheral defocus is associated with myopia progression. So that means that peripheral defocus limits myopia progression to the point that Carrie just made, and to determine whether changes in ocular shape differ from uh, soft multifocal and glasses, and we talked about actual lens here. So they recruited in, in a double mask study, uh, subjects were randomized, fully randomized, multi-centered, around 300 participants, a little bit over 50% were female, uh, mostly Caucasian, with an average uh, myopia at the beginning of minus 2.39, and an length of 24.5. They were 10 years old uh, in, in average at the beginning of the study, and the study lasted for three years. Uh, after three years, here are the, the results, and Mark will be happy because we don't talk about percentage, we talk about, you know, cumulative effect here. So it's, um, 0.56 diopters for the high ad, the plus 250 ad, uh, and 0.42 millimeter of actual end progression over three years. So the, you, you divide these numbers by three to add the average, for, even if we know that it's not linear in progression. You know, some years you, you progress more than others, and habitually any kind of strategy will be more effective the first year compared to the following years. So it's very important to, to remember. Median ad plus 150, you had 0.85 diopters of evolution, 0.58 actual length. And as for single vision, 
contact lenses, not glasses, uh, single vision contact lenses, one diopter in 0.66 millimeter. So what is really interesting is postdoc analysis proved that for those progressing more than one diopter per year, that's huge. Everybody around here will qualify these uh, kids as fast progressors or not responding to therapy, you know, progressing one diopter per year. Only 16% of them did that with the higher end and 51 with the single vision uh, pair of contact lenses. As for the HLN over 0.36 millimeter, which is again huge, 50% with the eye ad and 80% as for, for single vision. So here you have the answer to your first question. If you look just at the diopters, you may find that this device is highly effective. Only 16% of kids will progress of one diopter or more, but at the same time, the same kids, based on the actual land, almost 50% of them increased by 0.4 millimeter over three years. It's it's good control compared to single vision lenses, but still, the maths are not adding up. And and if you don't measure the actual land, you don't know what the real progression of that kid is. And versus my site, we 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 just talk about, you know, um, the the this. Uh, this device, the Biofinity D lens, uh, showed 0.23 millimeter slower progression versus uh, uh, single vision lenses compared to 0.32, so quite similar to my side lenses. So overall, uh, there was 55% slower progression, not for not 45% efficacy, 45% slower progression compared to single vision lenses. No adverse effect. Remember, these were daily wear, monthly disposable lenses. And if we want to provide an affordable way to control myopia to parents, you know, daily disposable lenses is probably the safest in town, no problem, but it's costly. So if a parent has a budget issue, then Biofinity D, based on this study, can be as effective as my site, and you can provide a very, very, very good control on, on, that, on, on that area. And for the first time, again, this is a dose response. So that means that, you know, don't play with the smaller ad. Don't play with the lower ad because it is not effective at all. This is a real strong takeout message. You have to put the highest plus possible in the system compared to anything else. And this is why probably ortho -K is working still as a gold standard because when you do ortho -K the right way, you provide a lot, a lot, a lot of plus in that system, especially if you customize your design. So. Again, those response I add, and you can use safely monthly disposable lenses on kids. These are the take-home message of this study. Great. Can I just uh, add a couple of things there? Yeah, everything you said, or 90% of what you said, I agree with, Langy. Um Adverse events still do occur with these soft lenses, and they did report, I think, 11 cases of corneal infiltrates, and one of them was a presumed microbial keratitis. So we need to be vigilant and uh, pay attention to these. I would argue the effect size is not quite as good as my site, so my site should still be a frontline therapy, but if you're out of power range or you've got astigmatism and you need to go to a, uh, um, a distant center multifocal, then it's nice to know that you've got data, but I agree you shouldn't be messing around with low ads. Um, the 250 would be the one to go with. Now the question is, what if you had a four or a five, would that give you a greater effect, or is it just a threshold effect? If you're above a certain level, you get myopic control. If you have more myopic control, it doesn't add anything. And that, of course, will be uh, something we'll find out in the future. Good, you just signed up for to run that study, Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, you, but I, I, I can share that we did some study on that based on the corridor response. And uh, we know that it's not the perfect tool, but you know, based on several papers, we know that in the short-term corridor response can predict, in fact, what will be the outcome with a single device. And we tested you know, center distance plus five, plus 10, plus 15 at power. And, and we uh, expected the plateau effect, and believe me, there, were, there was not. Uh, hmm. The corridor response was still higher at plus 15 and probably the sweetest spot is around plus 10 at power um over than that you 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 blur too much you know the the, the signal in the periphery and you don't gain that much uh of uh, you know more efficacy based on the corridor response at least but you know up to plus 10 
you know, the field is open. I, I, I'm a strong believer of higher end powers. And look at Orto K, you know, what Kyrie is doing in his practice, you know, uh, you can witness, you know, that you on a pretty basis, you put plus eight, plus nine, plus 10. Because if you correct mm -hmm. a minus four, you generate plus four with regular or okay without customization. So minus four plus four, that means a plus eight add power, mm -hmm. and then you have full control, right? Right. Not sure Excellent. I agree on your math, but we should move along, Adam. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, um, Mark. You were next up. Uh, although we covered a lot of the next question already, so I got an interesting. Yeah, pass on the carry. What's that? <laughs> well, we get well, we've we've is, that question already. Let's move on to Carrie. Uh, I'm going to just I'm going to stump you by a, a very intelligent, deep question asked by a Dr. Canal here. Question is: Wouldn't vitreous depth be a better and more sensitive metric for tracking myopic progression and risk? Axial length is likely confounded by changes in anterior ocular component dimensions. Very interesting Great question. question. So. Um, the, the two are highly correlated. Now, axial length is ultimately, you know, what the, 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 the key measure. Vitreous chamber depth is going to be highly correlated and account for pretty much all of the changes you get. Now, one of the misconceptions is that when you put an ortho K lens on the eye, you affect the cornea so that axial length is no longer valid. Well, what you're really doing is you're just thinning the central cornea by a few microns, maybe 10 or at the most, what, 30 microns, 40 microns, Longy? Okay. Oh, well, less, less than that. Huh? Less than that. Less than yes. that. So you're talking about a thinning of the cornea, and that because of that, a reduction in axial length of about 20 microns. That's a fraction, a fraction of a diopter. So, and we know that really the evidence in terms of the cornea bowing um, and affecting anterior chamber that really doesn't happen with uh, ortho K either. So axial length and vitreous chamber depth are equally valid. And on most of our optical biometers, particularly the early Zeiss devices, you couldn't get vitreous chamber depth. Some of the more sophisticated ones, you may be able to, but both of them will give valid measures. They're gonna be highly correlated and there is no confounding of any meaningful amount by anterior chamber changes. So great, Thank great you. question. Though. Good question. Um, Carrie, I'm going to ask you to spend a little bit of time talking about informed consent for myopia control. What do you ensure you include in part of your informed consent docs? Well, you have to, you know, it's the duty to inform, so you have to tell them about the risks that are involved with the procedure. And any, as Mark was pointing out, with the con any kind of contact lens therapy, there, there are additional risks. MK is there in any modality we use. So it's you have to warn the patient on this likelihood that it's possible, even though it's rare, it's possible it could happen. And wearing glasses or other means to correct their vision is, is safer. So I think that is an absolute necessity to be in an informed consent. And you also have to provide material to your patients about the different backgrounds of the procedures that you're using and why you would choose a certain type of procedure that you're doing. So basically, you're, you're trying to educate the patient to the level of, your, of what you understand about the procedure. And, and that's uh, any good informed consent needs to do all of that. Great. Yeah, mine too. We, we, we talk about both, um, both the medical side of things. We also talk about what, what type of policies we have. Uh, for instance, we like to return full fees if we don't achieve what we promise to achieve. However, if they drop out because they just decide not to you know, not to take it any further, then, you know, we don't refund in the same way. So these are all documented and then there's sign off on it. And then we have that right. document if we need to. So um, we're going to, um, we're not going to wrap up. What I'd like to do now is I'd like to ask the, the speed question, the ending speed question, although we're not ending yet. And then we're going to go to the audience questions, which you guys can pick up randomly and discuss amongst yourselves. So the, the, the final speed question is, in your opinion, What's the most, the single most important pearl you can provide for a doctor considering starting a myopia management specialty? And we're going to start with Carrie and go the other way because we started the other way before. All right. Don't dabble. Do do something with intention. Do it fully and in, intent with the intention of success. I think that's the biggest thing I see with failure in this field is the dabbling that they do it every once in a while, they get their feet wet a little bit, then they get burned with something that doesn't work right and then they just drop it. So you need to really make a concentrated effort to do this. You're going to 
put this in your practice with education, with equipment, with resources, and 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 for you got to be in there for the long run. I mean, it's not something that takes a lot of education, so it's not going to be right away. You, you got to wait for that success. I agree. That's with any any specialty, absolutely. Mark, um, make sure you're better educated than the parents of your patients. Um, so do take the time to read as much as possible. Go to as many. Uh, online presentations at the academy um, go to my website and see some of the recommended readings there understand some of the questions that your parents are going to ask about what are the risks what are the benefits how long is this going to take um, make sure that you're the expert excellent and Langi. in fact consider every myopic kid entering your practice as a myopia control candidate uh, you know, talk about my prior control to every parent. They probably, not all of them will endorse this point of view and will jump in your my prior control strategy, but perhaps not this year, but next year they will do when they'll see that their kid is evolving by one diopter per year. But at least they are informed, as I, and I agree with Mark. So, um, and we play with whatever you want, glasses, anti-myopia glasses, uh, uh, soft lenses, ortho key, you know, you can put any multi soft multifocal lens approved for myopia control or, you know, similar design. It's, it's, it's piece of cake, you know, you can do that as an optometrist, uh, you know, do something. Don't let a patient go evolving and providing single vision glasses. That's the worst thing mm -hmm. you can do. Well, agreed. Well, that's great. All right, we're going to throw out some random questions here. Uh, uh, David Eng uh, says, can you talk about how the Cypress works? I have read about it, but don't really understand how varying contrast helps with myopia control. Anyone have any comment on that? The, the, the Cypress lens or the Cypress study is, is uh, being run by Sightglass. So they're the company that has a, a spectacle lens that has a, a regular center but it has some contrast um, lowering properties around the, uh, the outside of the lens. So the lens seems to be based on um, sound animal research, although it does seem to contradict some of our, what we understand, but it's not working in a refractive way in same, the same way that some of our other optical therapies are. Now, the results I've seen after one year seem to be very promising. I think this has the potential to be a winner. Um, they're the only spectacle lens therapy, as far as I know, that is undergoing FDA endorsed, if you like, clinical trials right now. So Hoya has a product. I haven't seen any evidence for them pursuing FDA approval. Same with other large manufacturers. Um, so it's, it's something that I would like to understand a little bit more, um, and hopefully we will in the future. I suspect there'll be some presentations on it at the Academy meeting in the next uh, few few weeks. Excellent. Um, we have two questions that are similar, which I'm going to merge together for anybody to pick up. Uh, one is, how do you manage myopic non-responders? I think people are saying, if you're using one method, you know, what do you do if it's not working? And the other question by Charles Griffin was, thoughts on combining 0.05% atropine with multifocal soft contact lenses or ortho K lenses. So I think those are questions are very similar. What do you do if you have a non-responder and does combining things have any benefit in your mind? The, the first um, thing, go ahead. sorry, go, go ahead, Kyrie. The, um, I, I've been doing a lot of combo therapy in my practice. Um, and that, I think that's one of the growing, this is gonna be one of the emerging fields that we work with which is combining um, low dose atropine and multifocal soft contact lenses or ortho K. It actually, the two methods, we don't understand the mechanisms of action with atropine, but we, we feel like, you know, in ortho K and multifocal soft contact lenses, we do. So apparently these different pathways can work together to actually enhance your effect. And I've got a lot of patients now in combo therapy. I think it's just, I see uh, improvements, you know, in the myopia control aspects of that. And, uh, 0.025 is the one we start with. Uh, I, I generally don't use the higher doses unless I have to, and we find that 0.025 is pretty effective in combo therapy with, uh, you know, either multifocal soft contact lenses or ortho K. Great. Anybody else want to comment on that? Or? Yeah, the first thing I will check if I qualify a patient as a non-responder will be the compliance. You know, sometimes we uh, 
we the kid will not wear the lenses as we prescribe it you know or for less hours than we prescribe it uh, so if they are wearing their lenses just four days a week and they are putting regular glasses uh, for the, for the remaining of the week so it, it won't be effective this is the first thing and the second thing is depending on what are my expectations? If that kid evolved by one diopter per year uh, in the last three years, you know, in a row every year, you know, you know, if I get half a diopter this the next year, I will be happy, not completely happy, and then I will go with carry and put atropine and uh, on top of it in order to reduce the, this rate of progression to 0.25. So there's multiple definitions of you know progressing or not responding, but you know. You have to check every aspect and, and to modify your strategy if it's not working at the end. So yeah, I'm I'm not corrupted by seeing patients, but I'll say two things. One is if your frontline therapy is atropine, you still need to correct the refractive error. So why wouldn't you try and do something additional, whether it's spectacle, contact lens, or OK? Secondly, there's two um, clinical trials just recently published on combination therapy. And atropine seems to make a have some benefit, but maybe in the only the low myopes where the ortho K just isn't effective. And we know that in lower myopes, which have a lower ad, um, ortho K is not as effective in patients with more robust myopia. So atropine seems to pick up the slack when ortho K is not working. The other thing is um, in the study out of Hong Kong. The benefits of ortho K, sorry, the benefits of adding atropine seem to only occur in the first six months of their 12 month data. So you got an initial slow in due to the atropine that wasn't seen after six months through 12 months. So there's a lot more to learn here, and it's certainly one of the growth areas for practice, and we need to understand a lot more about the data. Right. Yeah, I think I think also with Lungis, I think we're running into this thing too. What's the dilation effect on the people with ortho K yeah. too? I mean, yeah, yeah that, that we see is unclear. So, are you getting an added therapeutic effect at right. the retina level, or are you just dilating the pupil and you're increasing the optical effect? So, yeah. you know, it's an easy control to do, I guess, with phenylephrine. But who wants to do that study? So let's move on to another question now. Um, do you have? And we'll make this a quick one for each of you. Is there an age limit to starting myopia control? I, Upper or lower? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true, yeah. Uh, you see, post-college, I don't know you guys, but in the 30s now, I'm watching progression, progressive myopia. Um, I start usually at age four because I want the patient to talk to me to be able to communicate what's going on. Um, this is serious stuff when you're doing anything to, to a young child and, and you want to have a communication level, you want to have maturity uh, to um, from that child and what's going actually happening. Um, so my stop, my uh, date, uh, age is four years of age when I begin the, to think about that and consider. The, and, and then, of course, with axial-like measurements, that you're, that's going to really key your decision-making. If you have a very young kid, already myopic, um, I would first look at some neurological issue or syndrome like that uh, yeah. because it, it, these are not the same guys that we will pick up later on around 10 years old and myopia is evolving at a different rate this is a different scenario we are dealing with a different animal so it's it's you know I will I would be very cautious about that yeah my uh, my, my Dutch friend Carolyn Claver who's uh, sort of uh, heavy into the genetics as well she says if the uh, if the diopters are greater than the age, you need to really consider genetic testing because you may be looking at something like Stickler's or another syndrome. So, and the other thing, I, I'm working on a paper with some French collaborators, and we're seeing that um, myopia progression in the younger kids isn't as rapid as in the six-year-olds and older. So, if you do see a young myope three, four year, years of age with, say, two or three diopters of myopia, they may not progress in the same way as a six or seven year old. So in a, in a really young kid, I think some hand holding and seeing where it's going, maybe the appropriate referrals before you institute therapy. Great, well, we've got a couple more to get through, so I'm gonna Hello, move on. Right. Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, get you up there, Mark. 
Um, so a doctor who, uh, a Dr. Wood has a question relating to myopia progression and congenital vision impairments. She says that many of her congenital low vision patients do not appear to have myopia progression, such as patients with ROP, optic atrophy. Is there some relation between best corrected acuity, myopia progression with these, these type of congenital vision impairments? That anybody have any information on that? Well, again, I think you're dealing with a different group of patients. Now, there's there's evidence from the literature where people have untreated congenital cataracts or ptosis or other opacities, you get a form of uh, deprivation myopia in the same that we see in animals. Um, but again, you're talking about, you know, with ROP, with a bunch of um, uh, other conditions, you're not talking about the, the common or garden myopia that is sort of carry and Longis bread and butter. Gotcha. Um, question uh, from Dr. Hamakiotis. Any thoughts on effects of different wavelengths of light, like home lighting, uh, in terms of its ability to help myopia progress or to control it? Any data on anything like that? Uh, one study published many years ago from uh, China, obviously, um, showing that uh, incandescent lightning, uh, in fact, they, they, they took genetics and surrounding environment. So if you have one or two parents myopic, low or high myopic uh, patients and different condition of lightning, and they proved that incandescent lighting is less harmful if you have one or two parents that are already myops compared to fluorescent or, you know, the uh, the Dell lightning, and in the Dell because of the, uh, the the cold Dell, I would I would qualify it, you know, because of, of a spike of blue light, is more harmful compared to the um, kind of a modern Dell light, which is uh, more equilibrated, I would say, uh, in, in those in those things. And Earl Smith at a given point talked about the chromatic aberration in the eye and chroma and depending on the light the white light is you know obviously made of all of these wavelengths and the blue wavelengths focus in front of the retina and again based on the animal model uh, the retina prefers to focus on the longer wavelength that the red light so if you have if you are exposed to a lot of blue light, that kind of blue light with short wavelengths, it may it may be perceived maybe perceived as a form of deprivation or out of focus or or defocus centrally that promotes myopia. But again, it's judged on the animal model. Um, I I'm not aware of any study made on humans based on the chromatic aberration. But these are you know nice concepts to improve explore it's, it's the future. I think we can all agree that spending more time outside reduces the incidence of myopia, but what is it about outside that has the effect? Assuming it's the daylight, is it the color? Is it the light level? Is it something optical? Um, this is one of the great unanswered questions. Again, Earl Smith's going to be presenting some things at the Academy meeting on this topic and has probably the best data around in animal models because the chick model kind of shows you the opposite as the tree shoe and, and the monkey do. So um, listen to what Earl said, but I, I think the jury's still out on exactly what we should be doing uh, with indoor, indoor lighting, whether just cranking it up or uh, changing the colors. All right, last uh, audience question uh, from uh, Aparna, Dr. G we'll call her, I can't say that last name. Talk about the any influence there might be of astigmatism on myopia control, specifically higher levels above 250. Again, Very it's really important. Difficult, really difficult to study this because there's relatively few people around with that level of astigmatism. Um, you know, one of the great sort of dilemmas in many respects is we have a lot of peripheral astigmatism in the eye. So how does the peripheral retina interpret anything related to focus or blur in the presence of that? But um, it would be a very difficult thing to study. I don't know whether you know anything about it, Longy. Uh, we 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 had at, at the beginning we had very few tools in, in, in the end when we began our myopia control uh, clinic at the school, and and some of these patients ended up with you know soft multifocal lenses with you know three quarter of astigmatism remaining non corrected, and uh, m most likely in those kids where we had this situation in one eye only 
this I evolve a lot compared to the other one that was purely spherical and well corrected. So, uh, and over the years, we witnessed that any kind of astigmatism, refractive astigmatism of three quarter of diopters or more, not left non corrected, is promoting myopia. This is my heart. This is my feeling. This is what we had as an experience in the clinic. So we are really, really, really looking at correcting everything. And uh, if it's not possible, not okay, uh, I, we customize everything so we can correct up to these two and a half diopter of corneal seal with, you know, um, base curve of the uh, ortho K lens is toric, the peripheries are toric, obviously. So we can we can manage that with a lot of software available in in, in, the, in the market. But if you are providing soft lenses, for example, because you don't do ortho K, that's okay. You know, multifocal, multifocal soft lenses on that kit, but make sure to correct the remaining astigmatism in regular glasses on top of it, because otherwise my API will evolve at a fast rate. I'm going to so, throw the anecdotal flag on that one, Longy. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, Canadian experience. You know, it's everything is different up north. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, unless you have anything else to add to that, I'm going to uh, wrap this up and say and thank everyone for participating and thank you for tuning in today. If you missed it, part of the webinar or there's anything you want to go back and review, you'll get a link uh, to the recording in the next week in your inbox. Special thank you to Michelle Stecklin and Oculus for their efforts in pulling this together and to our esteemed panel and my friends on that panel, you guys are fantastic. There's so many questions. This is such an exciting uh, specialty for optometry. I appreciate all the insight you gave everyone and, and wish everybody success in managing their own myopia practices. Thank you, Alan. Thanks, Alan. Uh, thank you, Alan. Everybody Good be night, safe. Everybody.